that activity, which I'm going to be delivering before the Star Wars. Because uh, not many people know that I am, in fact, um, a PhD student in astrophysics, so I should be testing you on space theory a little later on. Um, yeah, thanks again for coming. You're all very welcome. It's great to see you all. Um, my name is Paul Blake, and I... Hello, gentlemen, come in, come in, we've started. You're late, I should be asking questions in two minutes. Uh, I played Greedo in the very first uh, Star Wars film. Right. Yeah. 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 Greedo does rule, I agree. He is the best and most iconic of the Star Wars <laughs> <laughs> Which is what my mother told me to say, anyway. So here I am. Uh, it was. Um, I'll give you a little bit of, about the background. Of Tell me when I start boring you and just put your hand up and ask questions. But I'll give you a little bit about the background of uh, how I got the job and got into the whole thing in the first place. I was actually working for the BBC in, in London, because we lived in London. And uh, I was doing a, a kids program called Jack and Ori, which is a, it was a kind of iconic kids program. And uh, we told stories and uh, went out at about five o'clock in the evening. And every Christmas they had a Christmas special of this show. And I was doing one of those uh, at Christmas, and there was this guy in it who was a bit of a pain in the ass uh, called Tony Daniels. And uh, he said, uh, I'm, doing this, um, I'm doing this film. Not very nice, Tony, but that's very nice. Uh, but the director, who was American, which immediately kind of put me off straight away, of course, um, uh, is looking for character actors to come and be in this uh, uh, film he's doing over at Pinewood, are, are you interested? And I said, yeah, well, yeah, anything, you know, for a few quid. I'd be happy to turn up. He said, well, he wants you to go and see him tomorrow morning at uh, the studios if you're interested. Well, thanks, Tony, that's great. Uh, so, next day, I got on a train, went over to Pinewood Studios, which I think is where we did it. It was either Pinewood or Elm Street. I can never remember. But, um, turned up at the studios about an hour late. Uh, it was very early in the morning. And the studios, as you know, are big places. They, the, the sound stages of time were, were pretty big in England, even for England at the time. Uh, and um, I walked out onto the, um, the sound stage, and there was nothing there but sand covering the whole sound stage. It was a massive place. And these fantastic arc lights just covering the ceiling of the building. And they were on. Nobody ran. Very early in the morning. I was desperate for a cup of tea or a cup of coffee. <coughs> And there was one guy right in the far corner of the room, sort of messing around with a phone. So I went up to him and said, look, my name's Paul Blake. I've come for a, a, an interview to see this guy called George somebody or other. I don't know what his name is. But anyway, he's the, I think he's the director. And look, I'm really thirsty. You couldn't get me a cup of coffee, could you, please? So uh, he said, yeah, sure. Comes back, gets me a cup of coffee, gives me a coffee. I said, look, you don't know this guy called uh, George um, Luca, Luke, Luke or somebody or other. Um, I think he's the director on the He said, I, I, I'm, I'm George, uh, George Luca. So George Luca's actually fetched me a cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I even got the job. I'm amazed that after that we had a chat and he was charming. Uh, all the things that you've heard about him are true. He's very shy. He's a, he was a very sweet guy, actually. And he seemed to know what he was doing. He said, well, you know, um, yeah, it sounds, sounds, sounds great. Um, would, you, would you like to do this little part? I said, yeah, sure, it'd be lovely. Not knowing uh, what was actually going to happen, as none of us did at the time. And in fact, in the, it was 1976 when we filmed it, the summer of 76, so I must have done the interview in sort of January or February. And uh, science fiction films at that point in England, and in fact all over the world, were pretty bad. They were B-movies. So, to be associated with a B-movie wasn't a great career move for a very young and handsome, I might add. <laughs> so, um, I uh, thought no more of it after he said, yeah, we'd, we'd like you to come do it. So I said, oh, fantastic, thank you so much. Um, when we started shooting, I got a, a little schedule, popped along, did the two or three weeks uh, that I think I was um, contracted for on the film. And the first day I, I met George on set, being a, a, a very eager young actor who'd been working with the likes of Gary Oldman and Alan Rickman in a theatre company up in, 
in Scotland and said, um, excuse me, do you, have you any idea how you'd like me to, to play this character? This is a green monster with a green head in a science fiction book. So he looks at me intently and said, yeah, play it like they do in the movies, which was the best advice I've ever got in any part in history. Play it like they do it in the movies. You know, you think that's very sensible advice. So that's how I got the job. Then, six months later, I filmed the scene and the sequences, and I think I was on the film for about three weeks altogether. But of course, all the, all the Greedo scenes... Um, Greedo didn't have a name at that point. He, I, I did have a, a big script sent to me, so I was very lucky, because most of the sort of the smaller part players, like um, Boba Fett and other characters, uh, <laughs> uh, only got pages of script. I was sent a big uh, script, full script and could see that there were several scenes with Greedo in it. He didn't have a name, he was just called an alien of the script. And he had no character really, and, and no, uh, certainly no idea of, of what the alien was going to be. So I, um, when it came to going to see the costume designer and the makeup artist, uh, we, we popped along to the studios on the days allotted that all of us aliens had, and we sat down and had what was known as a life mask. Uh, and in, the 70s, the life mask was you sat in a chair, like this very, uh, same gentleman in front of me, and uh, you had two straws shoved up your nostrils, and you had a, a kind of very thin uh, solution applied to your face to protect it from plaster of Paris, which they then stuck over the front part of your face, and you sat there in a chair until that hardened. It didn't take long, but it wasn't too painful. Uh, and then they took that off and did the same for the back of your head, glued the two bits together and poured in this um, rubber solution, which then solidified and formed a sort of rather rubbery base of your own imprint, of your own face, which the modelers and the designers would then work on and build up the mask that they then built up. Of course, that was only the first step. The next step was these poor designers then had to develop God knows how many characters you saw in the canteen sequence and all the way throughout the rest of the film. So by the time they got to designing my little character, Greedo. Um, the very brilliant designer really had come to an end of what he had an idea of doing. So he, he sat down, I think, with George uh, a couple of nights before they were due to start filming those sequences. And he still hadn't an idea, but he'd seen a commercial on TV for Bird's Eye Peas. I don't know whether you get them in the States, but we certainly got them in England. Uh, and he saw this bouncing pea. And that's where he got the idea for Greedo. <laughs> so Greedo is, in fact, a bouncing bird's eye pig with a few little uh, spikes on top of his head. And that's how the sort of little iconic face came about. And, um, and then we started doing all the filming, all the sequences. And of course, I did a lot of stuff with an actor called Declan Mulholland, who you probably all know was the first Jab of the Hut. And we filmed a good three weeks of material with um, Jabba, uh, Declan as Jabba, and Harrison. Uh, lots of other stuff. We had great fun because uh, there were pages and pages of this. And there was one sequence which was brilliant, which I'm so sorry, which George must still have, uh, but certainly didn't appear in any of the movies or the special editions, uh, was a, a gunfight that Harrison and I had underneath the Millennium Falcon uh, with laser guns. And uh, we did this, we filmed this for about two days running with all kinds of explosions and special effects. And then a whole pile of um, uh, hi guys, come in, come in, sit down, I'll be passing through and asking questions in a minute, so be quick. Uh, I've, got, I've got popcorn in mind here. And, uh, and, and that sequence had, um, had a whole pile of stormtroopers coming in, running through massive double doors, and then we both of us turn around and start firing on the stormtroopers. So, fantastic fun for about a week, and then George decides he wants to cut all that. <laughs> so all that then ended on the cutting room floor. And uh, he decided to go ahead with the jabber that you all know and love as the, uh, the, the puppet, which was operated by, by three people, one of which was Mike Evans, who was in the tail. And I can't remember the other two people, but you, you obviously must know about all that. Um, so that's what we did up until the point that uh, it was all completely chaotic filming on Star Wars in those days. Nobody, apart from George, knew what was going on. Nobody had any idea of how the movie would turn out. Uh, in fact, from day to day, George was so pressured with money from the money guys that he uh, was constantly beleaguered by the thought of having to stop filming. In fact, Harrison, who got the job, obviously because he was brilliant, 
And you all know the joke about Harrison getting the job. He was working as a carpenter on a lady's house in Kentucky. And uh, he got the call from Harrison and nipped down to the studios, and she's still waiting for the roof to be finished to this day. So that's the, uh, <laughs> that is the story about Harrison, how he got the job. But even after three weeks of filming his sequences, the guys who were putting the money up did not want Harrison to do it. Uh, because they, he was nobody, they didn't trust uh, George, they didn't trust Harrison, and uh, there was a kicker in Harrison's contract that they could get rid of him even after he'd started filming the movie, until the guys saw those initial two or three weeks of the rushes, and then thought, this guy's not bad, <laughs> and decided to go along with what he did, and it was just uh, incredible to think back that they might have kicked him off and used Tom Selleck or somebody else, who was perfectly good, but would not have been the same. Uh, iconic character that Harrison Ford became, that Han Solo became. So that's how I, I got into the whole thing, and uh, you can probably tell me much more about the bits and pieces. But let me throw it open to you. I'm sure you want to ask a few questions about certain scenes. Um, let me ask you if you have any questions to ask me, either as the actor or as the Don't be shy. I'll be gentle with you. So. Oh, this is the um, I saw the like the voice acting, like who were doing the cast, and I, and I saw that Kurt Russell was was one to do the voice, uh, doing really? the, doing the uh, on solo. Wow! And, uh, I was wondering if you had get a chance to see, you know, Kurt Russell before. I didn't, I'm afraid. I wish it would be great to have been a, a fly uh, on those all those audition sequences. Yeah, I, I mean George must have them in Skywalker, right? No, I, no, I saw it in uh, YouTube. And, yeah. you know, all this. All yeah. the people are, are, are auditioning this. Well, Kurt Russ is a pretty good actor, and I mean, and he was he was wonderful in things like uh, Big Trouble in Little China and all the rest of it. He could, <laughs> he could be pretty good as uh, Han Solo, but mm, not my idea. Yeah. Anyone else? The cantina scene. They say like, who shot first? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, the best in your order. Who shot first? Well, you tell no, me. No, no. There was a there was a, a scene like he never like that we never saw. Yeah. That you shot first, but yeah. you missed him. Well, as I've told many of you, I think a bit earlier on, but maybe not all of you have heard, I have the badge and the t-shirt, which says hand shot first, so who am I to argue with that? It's obviously the truth. Uh, and there is the story, of course, that Greedo did go to Assassin College. He was a very good assassin. No, no, no. Please don't laugh, I'm so ashamed. He was a brilliant assassin. Unfortunately, Post range day came up. <laughs> Nasty flare up of green hair. So he was off at home with Mrs. Greedo, who well, I might say was very persuasive. And he was having a time at home on short close range day. So, Grassy Knoll, he would have been fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Three, four months of Grassy Knoll training. <laughs> and it, he was implicated in the assassination of Kennedy, I have to say. <laughs> but if it had been Grassy Knoll, he would have been there. Unfortunately, they told him like unfortunately, close range day was not his forte. But I mean, we were sitting this close. Maybe only one night. We were sitting this close. I could not have missed. But then, of course, George changed it for various reasons. I mean, first, you know, um, there is a story that the moral majority uh, in the South pressurized George to change it because Han Solo's character through wiping Greedo away like a swatted fly, was made to look a bit more too, too much like a space cowboy, which of course he was, <laughs> and therefore had a brilliant storyline and redemption and became good. I mean, it made so much sense for him to brush Greedo on uh, with the first, you know, with the first shot. I was shooting from under the table. By the way, if any of you see that picture in, in the film, well, I think, I think I have one which you might be interested in. It'll be in 20 dollars later, I guess. Um, and uh, you see him in the rehearsal uh, photo, um, sitting there with a gun like that and his other hand on the table like that. And he's in fact smoking with his other hand. But of course, uh, that was airbrushed out of all of the rehearsal shots and the movies because it was so politically incorrect to smoke. More, more politically incorrect than to shoot Greedo, in fact. <laughs> but yet, yeah, he's changed it how many times, you tell me? Three or, three or four times. And he, he did make, say something recently, didn't he, about uh, two or three weeks ago, about who shot first. But uh, yeah, I have the t-shirt, hand shot first. You've heard it from the horse's mouth. Sir! Um, how did the makeup feel? 
it, a very good, interesting question. As I said, it, for us in those days, it was brilliant because the mask ended here. So you could take it off and put it in fact. That summer was the summer of 76, very hot in England. No brilliant air conditioning in the studio, so it was massively hot. And my overriding memory from those days and it, it is of 40 dwarfs all in costumes <laughs> running around, <laughs> shouting and screaming, being very difficult and very prima donna ish, and all trying on different heads as they went along. So the, the only problem with those masks was that they did smell. Yeah. Pretty nasty after a while, and of course you sweat it pretty, pretty quickly. But from my own little past, I mean, I, I was as guilty as everybody else. I tried it with somebody else's heads on. Broke them. Praying mantis, I broke at one point. Remember that praying mantis at the corner? You probably don't. But it was a wonderful sort of puppet of a. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I broke that twice, and they were very And uh, but that, I mean, yes, very good question. The the costume for me was great because you could take a head off, put it on the table. And, and the outfit was very light as well. It was made out of all, of, like all the sets and bits and pieces in Star Wars. It was begged, borrowed, and stolen. And, uh, I mean, they, I think the designers had a brilliant job lot of aircraft uh, material, which they bought for 50 grand. And most of Star Wars was built from that stuff, from plastics. The costumes were, were again, begged and borrowed from all over town. They didn't uh, hire anything from any of the major costume. Uh, hiring places. It was all made for us. And of course all the um, stormtroopers, iconically, uh, their costumes were the worst ever. In fact the guys who are stormtroopers now have much superior quality of, of, of outfits than <laughs> we ever did. They were, it was always falling off. So the scene would start and somebody's costume, somebody's arm would fall off. <laughs> Cut! You know, so that would be it. So it was pretty, uh, pretty primitive. So, I have a question uh, no, about the scene you know, where you're speaking, obviously. Uh, yeah. Did you actually have to say anything? Or did you didn't say yeah, anything? Yeah, I did. You were dubbed over, right? So, yeah, no, I, I was very lucky. I'm, I was not lucky, depending on your point of view. Um, I did all the dialogue with Harris. I was a very stupid young actor. And um, I said to Harris, um, look, I'll do, I'll, do the, uh, I'll do the dialogue with you, Harris. And we can, you know, we can do it. And we'll do it. And she said, no, great, great, okay. So we did it all in English, and then the voice, my voice, was uh, electronically scrambled, and then that's what was used in the in things there. That's why it sounds like new. It's not uh, that also. So it's still my voice. So I was one of the few. All the other English actors who were very, very, um, I mean, they were very um, well known and rather they had pretty. Decent pedigrees in the English theatre at the time, and rather austere. And they were dubbed by all you guys. You know, I, I mean, that's how you uh, so use a lot of them. Except for Guinness. Guinness, of course. Well, Guinness was the Well, again, I was very lucky because I'd, I'd actually been in a play with Alec Guinness only a year before. Oh, so wow. I knew him because I was in a play with Alec Guinness only a year before. So I knew him. <laughs> Enough to say, hello, Sir Alec, because you had to call him Sir Alec. He had that street, you know. You had to call him Sir Alec until he went, call me Alec. And then you could call him Alec. But, so he didn't know Harrison or Carrie or any of those people. But he knew me, so I felt really rather sort of... <laughs> <laughs> Paul, hello, come over into my train. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah. What did he become an idol? Oh, uh, oh, quite a long while before Star Wars was made, I think. Oh, I mean, he had made 50 major films before Star Wars, so he was the big star. Uh, and, uh, and Harrison and Carrie were, were pretty in awe of him, really. And so was George. George and, and uh, Alec would just send out his... My mum was telling me I had an uncle who was an extra in the Bridge of the River Kwai. Oh, yeah. He was not really credited because he was in the, uh, the Navy at the time. Oh, right. He was yeah. an extra. I think everybody in the world was in the Bridge of the River Kwai. Yeah, it's a brilliant film. Excellent question. Any more questions, ladies and gentlemen? Or shall I start my tap dance now? <laughs> Sir, yeah, oh. did, did, you count, did, did you keep anything from the set? Yeah, I did. You did. In those days, you did. But I did. I, I don't know why. Because it was all crack anyway. You didn't really want it. You didn't know that you could then, you know, make your entire children's private education from one piece. But I did. I, after my little scene, I think we did it on Friday evening or something. I, I kept the gun. Because they were all German Lugers. Oh, 
which had um, little bits and pieces glued onto them and made to look like that. And uh, the, yes, I think Peter Diamond, who was a stunt stunt guy, and he yes, I, he kept most of them. But he, I kept my little gun that I was supposed to shoot uh, Han Solo with. I took it home when I was living in London. I had a big family at the time. And after about two years, because you must remember that Star Wars in England, well, it, in the whole world, had this gradual climb of fame and, and, and excitement from everyone. It didn't, I mean, everybody loved it when it first came out, but its actual sort of stellar rise to an iconic film took quite a few years. And so I let my kids play with this gun for about <laughs> eight years. And then one, one, I think one summer, one of the guys who playing with it in the garden broke it. So I thought, oh, oh stupid. Ones. And I threw it away. Oh. Oh. I will bend over and be kicked now. <laughs> Do you know how much that gun would be worth? To over a hundred thousand. Even broken. Uh, <laughs> even broken. Absolutely. I mean, any broken. If you ever find yourself in a major iconic film, which I'm sure. <laughs> um, take whatever you can. In fact, it's very true now. Most of the riders in contracts are. You have to sign your life away before you do Harry Potter. Or Whatever, you know, um, because they're very frightened that that's going to happen. Because any prop from any of the, from, it's the same with the Wizard of Oz. If you have a prop used on set by one of the character, one of the main iconic characters, it's worth trillions and trillions of pounds. Only one, because there's so many people in the world who want it. So, I just want to thank you. I was seven years old when I saw Star Wars, and the brain damage is <laughs> But you know, you you've been an absolutely major part of. My, oh, you're so kind. My, very, my I, mean, I mean, that's very sweet of you. No, it's just cool. It was just, you you pulled me around. There you go. Do you know why we did that? Do you know why we did that? Because, um, as I say, we filmed that scene in a rush on a Friday afternoon. We all, we all wanted to get home. Yeah. It was hard. We were fed up and uh, waiting around. Like all those scenes, you do it in the last minute. Because they've taken all day trying to get the costume right, trying to get all the um, all the lighting right, etc., and doing the setups, and so we were desperate to get home. So Harris and I rushed through it as quick as we could. We rushed through the rehearsal, and the lighting guy rushed through that, and and the explosion bit when we came to do it, nobody knew what to do. He said, and, the, and the, I saw George calling over the gun, saying, "How are we going to kill Green?" <laughs> and the uh, <laughs> actor just kill him. You get plenty of those. So he, the, so the. The pyrotechnics guy you have on every film uh, came over. They used to be known as the Jelly Knight Man because they used to like blowing things up. So he said, oh, well, it's easy. Well, you know, they're sitting at this round table. We'll drill the table through and put in explosive little charges through it, and then we'll explode that uh, um, by a, a, a remote. And then we'll have Paul do the scene with Harrison up until the point that he's blown up, and then we'll put a dummy in his seat, filled with explosive, we'll f do a shot of the dummy being blown up, and then we'll do that, we'll put the costume back on Paul and have him fall over. They then said that to me. <laughs> <laughs> and you're, normally you're answering a film if you've got to do anything, they just, of course I do, you do it first. <laughs> That's what you do to try and save your life, but I was so naive, they said, yeah, of course, yes, I'll do it straight away. So, did the whole thing. it all went perfectly well. Uh, they blew the dummy up, it went all over the place like everything does. They ripped the costume off, which was still on fire. <laughs> <laughs> I put it on, complaining slightly, saying, This is still on fire! <laughs> and got the sort of jacket on quickly, sat in the seat, and they. So I then fell forward in an effort to get the seat. I almost fell before anyone said, Action! And so I fell forward as quickly as I could to get the scene open because I could feel this burning. And when I fell down, uh, George said, great, get some acid on the costume. So then they poured some acid on the back of the costume <laughs> to make it steam as well as smoke. So I was lying down there thinking, yeah, I want to go home. <laughs> so that's how it all happened. It was so happy. But it, like all those things, it worked fantastically well. What should have happened, of course, is like to be blown backwards against the wall. From a laser, gun. not fall forward, but in fact falling forward was so much more fun. <laughs> Everybody remembers it for some reason. Great question. What time is it? Half nine. We do another five minutes, ladies and gentlemen. If you have any more questions, madam. When you did it, like now, the language that Greedo speaks actually has a name, Hadid, both 
when you did it in 76, what were you saying? Were you saying the English line? Yes, absolutely. All the, um, all the, the script was in English, obviously. So, uh, I don't know whether you've heard the, uh, the special edition, but it does sound terribly English. And uh, as Brida and Stanley are saying, I say, would you give me, possibly give me the money for the spaceship on? <laughs> Which, for some reason, they didn't like. I don't know why. <laughs> but that's what happened. We did all that dialogue. I said, give me the money for the spaceship or whatever it was. And he says, over my dead body. Uh, or then I say something like, over my dead body, and that can be arranged. And then he shoots me and all the rest of it. But yes, it was all in English. And uh, a lot of it, I mean, all Harrison's best lines, he had lived. So, you know, George had a big script which was then taken to its limit and then somebody could say something and George would realise that it was great and kept it in there. And that's why Harrison, I think, became so good as in it because he had such a great sense of humour about his character. Madam? Is it weird watching yourself when you rewatch the movies? It is, but uh, you're right. Uh, uh, another excellent question because actors have this terrible cross to bear <laughs> especially if you started young and had some kind of, of um, involvement in something, uh, is you watch yourself age. <laughs> so you see yourself at 20, and then you see yourself, my God, I'm 97, and I'm, you know. So it's a weird thing to see yourself go, oh, I can do that because I'm doing bits and pieces of film and TV and, and all the rest of it. But it is a, it is a very strange thing, though. But it's also kind of a privilege. It's a great privilege to have been in Star Wars. I didn't think so at the time, but I certainly do now. For many years, people used to say to me, don't you regret being in a mask in the most iconic film of all time? And for many years, I said, God, yes, I fucking well do. <laughs> Why, I could have been Harrison Ford. I'm a, I was with the Royal Shakespeare Company. I've done Shakespeare. I played Macbeth, for God's sake. I could have been a star. Now, that's going to be on my tombstone, and I, I couldn't be prouder. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. Sir? Yeah. Uh, did you ever get a Rito action figure when they came out with them? Or did you get anything for Yeah, you know, the, the, yeah I have, I, I have a, 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 a... They do, Hasbro. Thank God for Hasbro. <laughs> 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 no, I mean, when they first came out, it was Kenner. Yeah, you know, yeah Kenner. Kenner, Kenner yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yes. They used to send us all the little action figures. I'm sure I've got lots, and Dave Prowse has got lots. Uh, and we used to keep them, of course, because they were fabulous. You know, and actors loved them, we loved them, but our wives did not love them. So <laughs> they would go into a, an attic or a big room, and then they'd keep coming, keep coming, and eventually the wife would say, that's got to go. So they all would. It's all of my stuff. I mean, I, I probably, I've still kept one or two really sort of sentimental bits and pieces, which I love. And uh, for instance, um, I can't remember the company, but they. I live in sort of the south of England, in a rural area, and, and there was a knock on the door one day, and this huge box <laughs> arrived, and it was the head of Greedo in sort of bronze, but about this high, and I looked at that, and I said, fantastic! I wanted to put it on my roof, but my wife, <laughs> no, no, we're not having enough on the roof, we're not having enough, so. Then everyone would know. Well, they do in my area. I'm mean, damn sure they do. <laughs> my kids go. Well, I would. your kids think anyone? Well, that's another excellent question. I mean, as you know, kids uh, hate their parents and wouldn't do anything to ridicule them at any point. But as they started to realise that they could sell a picture at school of me in a green mask, they suddenly became quite cool to that part. <laughs> and they did come to these events uh, from time to time. I had my two youngest, I've got lots of kids because there's nothing else to do where I live. So, <laughs> so uh, my kids used to come to the conventions and loved it. And, and the twins, who I've are now 22. Uh, the youngest one, he was it's not really much of a sob story, but he was a little bit brain damaged at birth and had cerebral palsy, but not that. Not so that he couldn't walk, not so that he needed the wheelchair, but he did have cerebral palsy. And he was a great fan, and he used to come and was very shy. And we, we were mostly worried about him, what he was going to do in life. Uh, but he did love coming to Star Wars, and he also loved uh, watching me take a few bucks <laughs> and make sure that he got a few bucks at the end of the evening. And, um, he has since, uh, we only discovered about four years ago, that he was quite good at running an athlete, and he's now the world 400 meter world champion. <laughs> and the world. <laughs>
so now I go to his events, and he's running in the Elite Paralympics this year, which is fantastic. Ah, so it's sort of changed roles a bit, but I'm very proud of him, obviously. Good question. What's the time? Is it, is it five more minutes? Any more questions, ladies and gentlemen? Sir, madam. Sir, sorry. Madam. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Besides the um, thumb hansel video, like, um, were there any more, like, crazy deletions that you guys have seen? Oh, lots, yeah. Again, Peter Diamond told me about a, a, a character he did, which was never in the, in the movie, which probably George, I mean, George's got a bit of this stuff. But uh, he played a character that, um, was completely made up of light bulbs. And he had light bulbs all over his head and all over his body and his arms and his legs and he moved around. He was known as a light bulb man. And <laughs> that, that wasn't in the film because it, it produced a few problems. When they tried to put the bulbs on and he started walking around, he electrocuted himself about a dozen times. <laughs> so they said that wasn't the best idea. But that was one of the more crazier ideas. So. Um, I know you said before that it was like, uh, like science fiction movies at the time were like terrible, and I was like, yeah. you felt like, and you didn't know what time no. you were bringing. No. Was there any point where like you were kind of glad you were in a mess, like if it was bad, like? No, I. That, well, that's the, again an interesting question. Not really. I mean, it's, it's perfectly true. You know, it could have been anything. It could have been Attack of the Killer Tomatoes, couldn't it? You know, <laughs> it, we could have been in the worst, another worst science fiction film, but. It did, when we were filming it, as I say, going out onto that sound stage and seeing some massive sand and there's these beautiful arc lights, and only down one end was a, 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 the cutout of the Millennium Falcon. The Millennium Falcon was only a flat with a, a ramp going up behind it. It was nothing, it was just, you know, boards, that's it. And you walked up the ramp and fell down the hole, so you got into the Millennium Falcon. So, so, but that was sufficiently grand enough for you to think, hmm, this is actually more interesting than I thought it was going to be. And it was obvious, because George had got such a great crew around him, and because Harrison and Carrie and Alec Guinness and uh, Tony Downs and uh, everybody else who, who was involved in, in those characters, even the smaller parts, were so good that you started to think, well, actually, this is quite cool, even then. Mm -hmm. So. Yes, sir, can you Yes, it went into oblivion. <laughs> no, I was very lucky. I worked in the theatre for a long, long time. I worked all over sort of England. I was in the West End for a few years in various plays, doing um, sort of snotty plays. I did quite a bit of TV. I've done about uh, sort of another dozen films. I worked in Hong Kong for quite a long time, for about three years, dubbing um, uh, kung fu films. <laughs> it was just awesome, which was absolutely... And I, in fact, did a... I was very big in China for a time. I did, <laughs> I did a part in um, uh, a TV series one called Hong Kong, Hong Kong. It was a very uh, original title. And it was kind of about two sets of warring brothers. And I played um, uh, a guy brought in as a businessman to try and sort out the business of, of these two. And I was given a really nice storyline. I had um, a girlfriend, a Chinese girlfriend, who the brothers had tried to fix me up with to persuade me to put money into their company, and she just happened to be, in, uh, in real life, the, the wife of the head of Run Run Shaw's um, Kung Fu Studios, uh, and he was the head guy who taught Bruce Lee and all, uh, a lot of the other uh, guys. So I didn't mess around with his wife. <laughs> but that's kind of what happened to me afterwards, and then I sort of uh, carried on doing um, a lot of TV in England. But as my family was going, my wife was an actress, and she was a dancer originally, then an actress. <coughs> and she was pretty successful in the West End doing lots of plays. And because we had lots of kids, we kind of took it in turns to look after kids at home. She would go away, do a project, and I would then look after the kids in London. And then she would come back, and I'd go away and tour somewhere. So it was, but being both involved in the business, it kind of worked out. And, um, and, and that's how it went on. I was very lucky. Because in those days you could have a career, you could go from one job to the next because there were a lot of jobs. Kids around now, I don't know whether it's the same in the States, have to be successful within five years of leaving university or drama school in the, in the in the movies or TV or the media. And in England we don't have the possibility of going into theatres anymore. It's, uh, uh, there's not many theatres left. There are in London, there's a lot of stuff, but you've got to be successful pretty quick. And I still do a, a few little bits and pieces. I do a lot of audio books. You know, because you can go to a studio, read a book, 
and uh, you don't have to look your best and you can just <laughs> do the story, take the cash and go home. And I, uh, I really like that. That's fun. Well, I think, ladies and gentlemen, you have been absolutely brilliant. And, uh, and just to remind you that I'm available for bar mitzvahs, weddings, and weddings. <laughs> And I'd love to see you all later on at, uh, at my desk tomorrow if you fancy coming and having a chat and asking any more questions. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Yeah, I just say goodbye to my friends.